be good ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be fully equipped. And I pray that God, that through our study of Bible doctrines over the next several weeks, I pray that you would open up eyes, give us understanding in these doctrines that we are looking at, help us to come to them with an open mind and a willingness to conform to the word. And I pray that, Lord, that you would bless every student tonight. And I pray for an anointing upon the students to gather and, and grasp the understanding that they need. So I pray for you to be with us now as we go forward over these next couple of hours, Lord. And bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, school is in session. So here we go. So we are going to be moving into the... Uh, Topic of Bible Doctrines, this is a part of our program, this is one of the required courses that we have, no matter what level you may be on. Some people have already taken a form of Bible Doctrines at some point in their college careers, but uh, maybe not to this level. All right, meetings being recorded, so you all behave yourselves. <clears throat> but I find it is a critical thing, because there are a lot of people that don't understand Bible doctrines. You know, you might be familiar with some church doctrines, but those are not what we're referring to. We're, we are referring to Bible doctrines. What we are looking at, our textbook, is coming from a Pentecostal perspective. And as I shared in the orientation a week ago, you may or may not be Pentecostal, full gospel, charismatic, whatever label you want to put on yourself. You may not be. But what I'm asking you to do is to approach this study with an open mind and an open heart in much the same way as I did when I was going through my master's and doctorate program. I studied not only Pentecostal theology, I studied uh, Reformed theology as well. Two different schools of thought on many different things, except for when it comes to salvation. You know, we are, we're all agreed upon that. But I had to take a look at all of the different perspectives on the theology as well as doctrines and the conclusion that you have to draw must come from the scriptures it cannot come from what a man says okay so we we label a lot of the things that we study you know we, we put labels on them but let's look for the bible let's see what the bible says to us okay my my belt pack here is popping off so whatever I'm like the dog on the back porch. When a squirrel runs out, man, he just gets distracted and wants to chase the squirrel. I may see calm, seem calm and everything like that, but sometimes I'm, I'm just a little bit like that dog, distracted easily. <laughs> Enough said. So we're moving into the topic of Bible doctrines from a Pentecostal perspective. As we begin tonight, we are looking at the authoritative rule. So what I suggest is if you have your textbook with you, that you get it opened up, and that you can follow through it with me because I'm actually, I follow the flow of the, of the book right now. That's what I'm doing so that I can read to you some of the things that are in there. But I also want to share insight on some of that stuff as well. So it's good for you to follow. You're going to find answers in there as you go through. If you haven't already completed your lesson, it is actually not due now until next week. So you have until next Friday, September the 24th which is a day of infamy, by the way. It's a, one of the most important days on the calendar. Yes, it is. Yep, it is. Thank you. Thank you. It's my birthday. <laughs> if you don't know me, I like to joke. Some of my jokes don't make sense. Well, most of my jokes don't make sense. But I enjoy myself doing it. All right. So the scriptures both the Old and New Testament are verbally inspired by God and are the revelation of God to man. The infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. That is a direct statement. That is a part of our statement of faith. And there are three scriptures that are shared that back this up, and I'm going to read them to you. I hope that many of you already read them when you're studying. It is a good thing. I know that as a student... I can remember my own days as a student. I would try to hurry through my lesson to try to get the questions answered. And I would always say to myself, I'll come back to this later and I'll study it a little bit deeper. 
You never will. The time to do it is when you're in it. You need to take your time. You need to read the scriptures, and you need to let the scriptures rest upon you. You need to soak them in. You need to go back and read these chapters a couple of times if necessary. Uh, you know, take a look at the questions. Get an idea of what we're looking for with the questions at the end of the chapter and skim through trying to find the different places that those topics are talked about. And then go back and read and highlight those answers as you go through. So you skim through, then you read through, you get all your answers. You're going to retain more and more each time that you do that. So let's go to the scriptures. I want to read these to you tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So there is a declaration by the Apostle Paul himself that what they were teaching and preaching was the Word of God. Okay? So that is a, a, a declaration in the Scriptures that the words that were taught by the Apostles, and Paul in particular here, were actually the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. And that from childhood, he's speaking to Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, here we go, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man, and this includes the woman as well, okay, that the, that the child of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Remember one of, the, one of the parts of our mission for Spirit Life Bible College and Seminary is the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Here we see another one, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what is it that equips us? The Word of God, the Scriptures. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So people didn't conjure this up. This was not a bunch of different men coming up with their own fanciful ideas and writing them down, and then we try to make them scriptures. That's not how it worked. All prophecy came by... Uh, by God. He says here, holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we have to realize that when we take a look, and we're going to talk about canon a little bit later tonight, but when we talk about the canonized scriptures, we realize they are recognized as authoritative. We recognize that they are infallible, that they are inspired by God. Now, they are infallible and inspired in as much as they are from the original language. We've already discussed this, uh, I believe it was Tuesday we talked about that. You have to be careful with man's translations because sometimes they differ. So anytime that there seems to be a contradiction in the Word of God, we have to fall back and say the original is without error. So therefore, these are men's errors in their interpretation. But most likely, most reliable translations that there are, you're going to find uh, some... Uh, continuity with each one of them, okay? So let's just keep that in mind. So prophecy never came by the will of man. So in our first chapter, we're going to deal with the scriptures inspired. That is one of the first tenets of faith. We believe that the scriptures are inspired by God, okay? So now we're talking about the authoritative rule. The authoritative rule comes from the inspired scriptures, all right? But there are three different types of, three, uh, of religious authority. There are three basic kinds that we are aware of. Number one, it's human reason. Number two, it's the church. And number three, it's God's word. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on these tonight because I need you to grasp the understanding of that because a lot of people are not aware that they actually operate 
and t the other two other than the Bible being the authority. You'd be surprised the number of people that really the rule of their life is not the scripture. And we're going to take a look at that here. So the most common today in our age, and it really came around in the 1800s, the early part of the 19th century, with modern thinking and modern theologians that began to deny the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ and began to deny the inspiration of scriptures and began to label it as other than inspired by God, given by God. So the most common uh, religious authority in our age today is human reason. Now, there are obvious facts about human beings having mental equipment. We, we all know that. We are not talking about that. So the, pro, the process of dealing with problems, I'm sorry, I got a cough drop in my mouth. The process of dealing with problems in a common sense fashion is called rationality. All right, not rationalism, but rationality. So what is rationality? The process of dealing with problems in a common sense fashion. Now, one of the things that God did give out was common sense. It may seem like it's not so common anymore, but yet common sense just simply means that we have the ability as human beings to look at situations and reason it out. We can rationally look at it and come to different conclusions. It's no sin to function in a rational level. Rationality must not be confused with rationalism. Now, I know it seems like, oh, this is technical, aren't they almost the same? Rationality is one thing. Rationalism is totally another thing. And here it is. This is in your textbook as well. Rationalism is the belief that the highest authority is human reason. Rationalism is the belief that the highest authority is human reason. Why is that dangerous? There are a lot more Christians that operate in this authority than they do under the Word of God. A lot of people that claim to be born again through the blood of Jesus Christ have little knowledge of the Word of God. And they do not recognize its authority in their life. They have more of a modern thinking about the way that they run their life, how they govern their life. So if it feels good to them, then it must be right. If it's okay for me, if I, I can do anything I want to do in private, that's rationalism. All right? Is my life my own to do as I choose with? If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, then the answer is no. The Bible teaches surrender to God, surrender to His will, but surrender to His Word. When it all comes down in the end, it's not what I think, it's not what I feel, it's what does the Bible say. That is the final authority in every situation. There are people that believe, they say, well, what may be good for you may not be good for me, and what's good for me may not be good for you, so you have to settle on your own truth, you have to settle on your own authority or your, your rule of life, okay? But see, that comes from where? Rationalism. That has nothing to do with biblical perspective. We are supposed to get into the Word of God, find out what the Word of God tells us, and then seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to that. If you give them enough time, the rationalists will contend this. And listen to this. This is in your book, but I want to read it to you. Human genius will unlock all the secrets of the universe and lead to perfect life, peace, health, wealth, and continuing prosperity. And now, let me tell you, that is the mantra of the modern-day society. They really believe that. They don't need God. They're a God to themselves. So their rationalism is their own authority. So one form of rationalism is scientism, okay? Scientism believes that science, with its modern methodologies and equipment, will eventually be able to analyze and solve all problems. Does that sound familiar? People are not looking to the authoritative word of God for their answers in this global pandemic but they're looking to scientists to save them. They're looking to scientists to tell them what to do. 
okay? And unfortunately, and I probably won't win much favor on this statement, is it's becoming political. Science is becoming political. Do you not see? People say, well, they, they got to do this. What is it? It is a rise of rationalism trying to take over the minds of our young people, trying to take over our minds. That's why it's time for a little bit of Holy Ghost resistance to this stuff. Rationalism is not the answer. But see, what's happened is that people are buying into rationalism as an authority over their life. When we as born-again believers, I don't care what denomination you are from, the Bible is your final authority, not science. Scientists are not infallible. And if they were, they wouldn't try to quiet everybody else that has a contrary opinion. If it contradicts what they say, they silence it. Why? Because they don't know. They would rather not contend. They just want to be the final say. They want to be the authority in it all. And if you don't listen to them, then you're a rebel. If you don't listen to scientism, you are the problem. Hello? That is rationalism. That is one of the authorities that we are talking about here that people live under. Do you not see how powerful rationalism is in our world? And so we as Christians, you know, we're going to talk about the other two here in just a moment, but we have got to move back to where the Bible is the center of our lives. The Bible is our final authority in our decisions. It has to be what the Word of God says. And we can't come up with doctrines that say, well, it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that, because, you know, God's grace covers all of these things. And they're contrary to the Scriptures. There are a lot of limitations to science, and I don't have time to talk about those tonight. And those who take rationalism as their authority usually end up making their own reason the final authority. They reason it out and they say, this is how I'm going to live. You don't like it? That's tough. This is the way that I'm going to live. This is what my belief system is, and that's what I'm going to live by. You have made human reasoning your final authority in your life. And therefore, it is wrong because you end up like Israel in the book of Judges. There are two different passages that I'm going to read from the book of Judges. And Judges 17, 6 says, those, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So just a quick question for you related to Scripture. I'll just This is a quick test for you. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going to be on anything else. Who was the final judge of Israel? Nope. No. Who was the final human judge of Israel in the period of the judges? Samuel. I just thought I would throw that in there as a bonus. You know, that's like a little treat that I've handed to you. But Samuel was the final judge. But what was the difference about Samuel? from the previous judges. The previous judges rose up. They did what God wanted them to do. But he also had a, a strong heart for God, and he was a prophet, and he was a priest. Okay? So the chaos and the confusion that results from trust in human reason as the ultimate authority are vividly portrayed in those tragic stories. The nation fell. Every time that people went into human reasoning, as their final authority, every time they began to do what was right in their own eyes, the society collapsed. Now, what we are witnessing right now globally is the collapse of many societies, the collapse of nations, because they operate in human reasoning and not with the Bible as their final authority. The challenge of the church, I believe, the challenge of, of, of leaders in the church is to bring people back to the authority of the Word of God and preach the Word of God and trust that what it says is true and not compromise it, not change it to fit within society. 
Your job is not to make people comfortable with doctrines, but to make them uncomfortable enough so that they repent. The Word of God makes you uncomfortable if you really read it for what it says. All right, so that's belief number one. The authority is uh, rational, rationalism. A second common belief is that the church is the ultimate authority. Now, I usually don't like to name names like the Roman Catholic Church, but this does, this does fit, okay? This is their view of authority, is that the church has authority. The authority of the church is equal to and sometimes exceeds the Scriptures, because their belief is that the Scriptures were created by the church for the church, not that the church was created according to the Scriptures, and that they have authority, that the authority of the Pope is equal to Scripture. In matters of church, he is the authority. So he can declare and, and establish new doctrines, new teachings. In the matters of the church, what he says goes, because he has that kind of authority. Uh, there are people that contend that Jesus gave his authority to Peter, and Peter laid hands on the bishops that he ordained, and he gave them authority to lay hands on their successors. That is what is commonly referred to, I, should, I shouldn't say commonly, most people never heard it, apostolic succession. Have you ever heard the phrase apostolic succession? Well, you've witnessed it in your life. You've witnessed it in the world. Because when a pope dies, or in some cases a pope has resigned, then they have to, they, they go through their ritual to determine who will be the successor to him. They claim that they are successors to Peter, the apostle. So they carry the same authority that the apostle Peter had when he walked upon the earth. It's apostolic succession. So, you know, by apostolic succession, this authority was transmitted from Christ through the 12 apostles and down through the centuries. And on this ground, certain churches hold themselves aloft as the only authorized representative of Christ. Now, it's not just the Roman Catholics. There are denominations that say, we are the right denomination, everybody else is wrong. Anybody ever heard that one? Yeah. We're right, the rest of them are wrong. And it's not just uh, mainline denominations, it's Pentecostal denominations as well. We're the only ones that are right, everybody else is wrong. You're doing things the wrong way. We got it right. We have true apostolic authority. You come to our church, you're fine. You leave our church, you're going to hell. It's not true. <laughs> no, I know. I <laughs> it's right. They do say that. That's, I'm, I'm picking on her. I can because she knows me well. Okay. So commonly associated with this view of apostolic succession is the assertion that the New Testament is a product of the church. Remember, I shared that just a moment ago. So that is their view. The New Testament is a product of the church, which is wrong. We know that. We, uh, the theory of apostolic succession never appeared until near the end of the 2nd century A.D. So that was not something that was done in the apostolic age. It wasn't until the late 200s going into the early 300s, getting close to 300 A.D., that they began to teach apostolic succession. Now, let me, just, let me just share some things with you about this, what happens, okay? Because it's not, not unusual for this age as well. You begin right. You begin with the scriptures in view, and you, you're doing everything that God wants you to do. But then all of a sudden, what happens is a little bit of desire for more power comes in. Uh, a little feeling of pride begins to rise up. Of course, we, we don't know where pride comes from, do we? <laughs> no, pride comes from the devil. That's what took him down. And we begin to think of ourselves as higher than what we really are. 
And some Christian leaders begin to act like they're higher than everybody else or they have a grasp on things that nobody else has and you need to listen to them. They act like they're kind of the final authority on the things of God happening in this age. And if you're not listening to them, you're listening to error. Self-proclaimed. Okay? Those things are dangerous. Those are the things that take you into error. And you begin to teach doctrines to support your view and people begin to say, well, that's what it is. They believe it true because that's what the preachers are preaching. And anyone can take scripture and twist it. Anyone can take a verse and isolate it from other verses and make it sound like what they're saying is reasonable because here comes that human reason. But what they're trying to establish is that they have authority and they are the final authority. In the, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, in the eyes of the church, that is a mortal sin? In the eyes of the church? What about the eyes of the Lord? Well, the church is the authority on the earth. And so, again, it happened near the end of the second century AD. And then further on, at the Council of Carthage in AD 397, they did not authorize the list of New Testament books that we today accept as canonical. They merely gave assent to what was already uh, recognized and used in the church of the day. It wasn't a time for them to canonize those because they just gave assent to the fact that that's what they believed. That was the common belief of the church, that the scriptures were inspired by God, that they were given, that it was the word of God. The teachings of the apostles were scripture. They believed that. I read those scriptures to you. The Apostle Paul said those very things. They believed it. There was no reason for them to think otherwise. Okay? So the church just commonly accepted the fact that the scriptures were the final authority, not the church. Okay. Now, that is the second one. The third alternative is to trust implicitly in the authority of the Word of God. All right, so those are the three alternatives. And the third one is the, uh, to trust implicitly in the authority of the Word of God. What page is that on Luke? Do you know yet? 19? Okay, I just want to make sure everybody's awake and that you're all with us. If you have your textbook, those of you that have textbooks, uh, page 19 is where we're at right now. So uh, the authority of the Word of God. This view is based squarely on the conviction that God by nature is self-disclosing. I'm going to say that again. The view of the authority of the Word of God is based squarely on the conviction that God by nature is self-disclosing. He's not astute. He's not hidden from us. He's not keeping silent. God speaks, and He has spoken through His Word. God is a speaking God. And it is God's desire to speak to His creatures. He wants to speak to us. I don't, I don't get it when I hear so many people think it's such a foreign idea that God speaks to us. And people say, well, I, I don't hear from God. You just told on yourself. That means you don't read the Word. <laughs> people that say, I don't hear the voice of God are people that don't read the Word of God. Because when you begin to read the Word of God, it is a living thing. The Word of God is alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword able to divide us under soul and spirit, joint and marrow, you know, all of those wonderful things. It, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God is a living Word. That's why life comes through reading. You find that the more you study the Bible and pray, the more alive that you feel. But when you get lazy and you backslide and you stop reading the Bible to read the Bible, all of a sudden you feel like you're just kind of drying up and drifting away. That's because you're not being sustained by a living thing, by the living Word. The Word of God, once you read it, it is alive for that moment. I can't live on today's meal. I could probably fast, yes, but after a while, my body is going to need nourishment. I have to take in more nourishment. That's the same with the Word of God. What I read today will sustain me today. I need to read more for tomorrow. I need to get my meal of the Word of God because it's a living thing. And the Bible talks to us about the fact that God speaks. 
in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. The prophets were given utterances by God to give to the people of Israel. When Jesus Christ came, He had utterances from the throne to give to His people. But He came as God. So God spoke to us. God spoke to the apostles. God speaks to us. The words of Jesus Christ are the words of God. Okay? So God has spoken. And his fullest and final declaration 